This podcast is a member of the Voices of Wrestling podcasting network. Visit VoicesOfWrestling.com to hear the rest of our great podcasts, as well as show reviews, columns, opinions, and updates across the world of wrestling. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of WrestleNomics Radio. I'm Brandon Thurston, broadcasting on demand from Buffalo, New York. Today is Friday, August 28th, 2020. On today's program, we'll think about how much money WWE is spending on the Thunderdome in the Amway Center. What does it mean for WWE's profitability in the year of 2020? Then, it was an unwieldy week in the world of wrestling television viewership. The first episodes of Raw and of SmackDown with the Thunderdome. AEW Dynamite aired on a Saturday. NXT aired again unopposed on Wednesday. How did they do and what does it mean? Then we'll talk about net income, the finances for some of the major Japanese wrestling companies, including New Japan, Dragon Gate, and DDT. And another week has gone by, and another week in wrestling fan resentment is upon us. But first, (laughs) some late breaking news. Executive Vice President Paul Levesque has cashed out more company stock. Levesque better known as Triple H, who only back in May made his first substantial sale of WWE stock, has sold more. On Wednesday and Thursday, he made sales with proceeds that total $2.4 million. Altogether, Levesque offloaded just over 45,000 shares. SEC filings show that after the sales, Levesque still owns 81,000 shares. Levesque's previous sale back in May was for just over $1 million. That occurred just days before his wife and WWE's chief brand officer, Stephanie McMahon Levesque, made a sale in a similar amount of just around $1 million. And no, I have no idea why he would be selling stock. It's not, uh, I I wouldn't say that it indicates much of anything. Could be for any number of reasons. Could be for personal financing reasons or choices. I also wouldn't be surprised if you see a record of another sale from Stephanie around the same time, which we did back in May. Uh, these aren't huge sales in the grand scheme of WWE's market capital. Paul Levesque, uh, in particular, is not a large shareholder relative to Stephanie. Uh, Triple H holds a tiny, tiny sliver of WWE stock. However, he did offload somewhere around 40% of the shares that he held uh, with this sales this week. And that is notable and that perhaps indicates that those with non-public information about the company don't anticipate a huge run-up in the stock price anytime soon. But consider that before this sale, uh, Paul Levesque owned, let's say, over 100,000 shares in WWE. There are 85 million shares outstanding in WWE. Stephanie owns a larger piece. She owns just under 2 million shares of course, Vince McMahon, the largest shareholder of any kind, still holds over 30 million shares in WWE. And again, that denominator is in diluted shares, 85 million. It varies from quarter to quarter. Or if you prefer basic shares, there are, I believe, about 77 million shares of WWE stock. And no, I can't tell you what the difference is between a basic share and a diluted share. But I do know that totals of the two are listed in WWE's financial statements. WWE's stock price, by the way, has been very stable since about late April, which coincides with the timing of the Q1 quarterly report way back in late April. That was April 23rd. That's also a couple weeks after the uh, cost cutting and employee furloughs and talent layoffs. But the WWE stock price has been quite stable since that time, hovering between, I would say, let's see here, I'm looking at the graph, about 42, 41 at the lowest, about 48 maybe at the highest. So it's been in that range in the mid-40s for about four months running in this COVID era of WWE finances. And then from there, a big week for viewership for WWE SmackDown, a big week in viewership for WWE Raw. They registered some of their biggest ratings, in months this past Friday. So not you're, you might be listening to this 
on the weekend. So not for the Friday that just happened, but for the week before. The introduction of the Thunderdome. SmackDown did a point six in the key demo of 18 to 49 for the first time since way back on March 22nd. Total viewership was over 2 million viewers for the first time since June 26th. Meanwhile, Raw, four days later on Monday, also viewed by more than 2 million viewers, and you have to go back to April 6th, the Postmania episode of Raw, to find the last time that Raw was viewed by 2 million viewers on average throughout their three-hour program. A key demo, a point six seven, and you have to go back also. I think that is, yeah, you have to go back also to the post-WrestleMania episode to find a point seven. This episode of Raw followed SummerSlam the night before on the W Network and on pay-per-view, and people often talk about the post-pay-per-view bump. Obviously, we see that in the case of WrestleMania, which we just sort of alluded to. Many of the biggest uh, Raw ratings of the year are the post-WrestleMania episode. Uh, Post-Rumble often does well also. Uh, sometimes there's not a strong pay-per-view bump at all, uh, particularly for the minor pay-per-views, I think. But what about SummerSlam? Does SummerSlam usually uh, provide a bump to Raw the next night? Well, I have a spreadsheet for that. And the spreadsheet tells me, and this goes back to uh, this goes back to September 2014. So this does not include the SummerSlam of 2014 in here. So all this data, by the way, is from Shoba's Daily, which you can find at showbizdaily.com. That's where I get this data from. That's where just about anybody who's talking about ratings gets their data from. They get it from showbizdaily.com, whether or not they credit showbizdaily.com. But compared to the trailing four weeks, this was the biggest SummerSlam bump for Raw on record, uh, or so in other words, at least for the last six years. Versus the trailing four weeks, Raw was up 38%. Uh, that's compared to in previous years, it had done a 5% bump, 11% bump, a 9% bump, a 12% bump, a 3% bump. In 2015, this year, 38% bump. So that's three times bigger by percent than any of the five years that came before. Now, that said, in the big picture, this 0.67 and just over 2 million uh, viewers is the least viewed uh, post-SummerSlam episode of Raw on the record to just give you an idea of how steep the decline has been. But nonetheless, Raw still ranking well within the top 10, with only five programs ranking above it uh, on cable on Monday. Uh, that in the key demo. In the Wednesday Night Wars competition, there was no head-to-head -head competition this week. Uh, again, as NXT ran unopposed, and there have been two airings of AEW Dynamite since we talked last. One on Saturday, another on Thursday. And so what have we learned here? Uh, NXT did over 800,000 viewers again this past Wednesday unopposed. It did 824 uh, the week before doing 853,000. Uh, both weeks doing an identical 0.24 in the demo. So what did we learn? It looks like when NXT runs unopposed to AEW, it gets an extra 150,000 viewers. Or in other words, about a 25% bump. And that 150,000 viewers, that's roughly the amount of viewers who are switching back and forth during commercials between the two programs. So viewership overall gets about a 25% bump. The demo, though, gets about a 33% bump. Its average in the four weeks prior to these two unopposed weeks was a 0.18. And again, doing a 0.24 in both of these weeks. For AEW, uh, Warner Media executives were reportedly thrilled with the viewership for the Saturday airing, which was viewed by 755,000 viewers, key demo rating of 0.31. Basically, this rating looks very much like a normal Wednesday rating for Dynamite. I was told before anybody knew what the number would be was that uh, AEW would be thrilled if they got a viewership of more than 700,000. Then Thursday, uh, another number that looks like a normal Wednesday night, 2-9 in the demo, 813,000 viewers. Uh, we should know too, the Saturday airing had a strong lead-in 
from an NBA playoff game that was on TNT that preceded it. Uh, for NXT, if you compare these two weeks where they've been unopposed, their female audience between the ages of 12 and 34 has actually been down slightly. Meanwhile, all other demographics for NXT are up uh, compared to the four weeks most recently when the program was uh, running head-to-head with AEW. So now, not running head-to-head with AEW, uh, not only did the young female audience not grow, it decreased. You can see graphs of this uh, on the WrestleNomics Twitter, at WrestleNomics. I don't know that we should read a lot into this, although it is a decrease. Um, this is the smallest demographic for either NXT or AEW, and maybe just the sampling makes this uh, metric within the F12 to 34 demographic very volatile. Nonetheless, you would think that NXT with a stronger women's roster would be among the demographics that would most be increased by the lack of competition from AEW. Maybe. But if you do the same comparison with AEW, uh, they've not done much better, or they haven't done better at all in, with female demographics in these two weeks that they have been sort of unopposed. Saturday was opposed by NXT TakeOver that was running simultaneously on the W Network. And you should consider here, too, that well, AEW Dynamite was not in its regular time slot. It will be next week on Wednesday when... It is running unopposed for the first time on a Wednesday uh, when NXT is preempted to Tuesday. But take these two airings uh, of AEW Dynamite from Thursday and Saturday and average them compared to the average of the four weeks prior where AEW did run head-to-head with NXT on Wednesday. And you find not only is the female 12 to 34 demographic down, not only the young female demographic is down, but the female 18 to 49 demographic is is down in that comparison as well. Even the people, 25 to 54 demographic, is down in that comparison. And I've got a graph on that on Twitter, at WrestleNomics as well, and one Mookie Ghana on Twitter has now, late breaking news here, has replied to the graph. This is from former WrestleNomics co-host and WrestleNomics founder, Chris Harrington, who works for AEW, who says in a tweet on this subject, from March 11th to July 15th, AEW averaged 40,000 viewers in the F18 to 34. So, by the way, he's talking about 18 to 34. Earlier, what we get, what I was talking about, what we get from Showbiz Daily is 18, 12 to 34. So, a very similar but not the same demographic. Anyway, he says AEW averaged 40,000 viewers in F18 to 34 with a low of 22,000. An average of 40,000, a low of 22,000, uh, which was on June 10th and a high of 50,000 on April 29th and June 6th. The last three shows of August have been 60,000, 55,000, 58,000. Mookie goes on, really the only outlier show is August 5th at 93,000. 93,000 also the alleged attendance of WrestleMania 3. Anyway, Mookie says, discarding that one show, it's been a pretty steady 59,000 average again in the female 18 to 34 demographic so i think what mookie's trying to point out here is that the last three shows of august including the last two which have been not on wednesday but on saturday and thursday saturday doing 55,000 thursday doing 58,000 those were in the female 18 to 34 demographic the young women demographic if you will those were above the average of 40,000, which Dynamite averaged from mid-March to mid-July. More from Mookie right here uh, as I speak. He has tweeted a line graph of NXT's female 18 to 34 demographic. So, er, so just a moment ago, we're talking about AW's female 18 to 34. Now NXT's 18 to 34. Uh, it's been a flat in the last three weeks, a flat 21,000, 22,000, and 22,000. So basically these last two weeks where it has ran unopposed, not opposed by AEW Dynamite, both of those episodes doing 22,000 viewers in the young women demographic, which is slightly higher from the most recent Wednesday when NXT and AEW ran head-to-head by 1,000. Mookie says NXT's uh, viewership in that demographic has been all over the place in the last year. Uh, Just looking at this demographic, uh, or rather looking at this line graph, 
Uh, it looks like it has declined slightly. Uh, year. So there you go. Former co-host and current vice president of business strategy, the man with the money, Chris Mookie Harrington, doing a probably doesn't know that he's done a run-in on WrestleNomics Radio. But next week, next Wednesday, AEW Dynamite will run unopposed by NXT for the first time ever on its normal time slot on Wednesday at 8, 8 p.m. Eastern. Uh, and what will its viewership be? Now we know NXT gains about 25% in total viewership, about 33% in key demo. What does AEW do? I would guess it's going to do something about in the same range, uh, the same percent of increase. So what would that mean? If we took AEW's last four Wednesdays with, with an average total audience of 827,000 viewers, and we multiplied that by uh, 1.25, gave it an extra 25%, AEW Dynamite would do over 1 million viewers for the first time since uh, it did do it did uh, a million viewers for the first three episodes of Dynamite back in October. And it has not done a million since uh, within those uh, four weeks. On August 5th, it did 900,000. Uh, that's its highest total viewership in quite some time. Now, what about key demo? I would guess the 33% jump on the key demo that NXT got is a little bit high for AEW just because it seems like that demographic is more likely to choose AEW over NXT in terms of live, live and same day viewership. So I'm going to guess that there's not as many people to capture. So in other words, NXT benefited more in the key demo by percent than I think AEW will benefit in the key demo. So NXT benefited by about 33%. Let's say, uh, AEW only benefits by 25%. So last four Wednesdays for Dynamite average is a 0.33. So if we take 0.33 and multiply it by 1.25, we get a 0.41, which would be the highest key demo performance since April, uh, November 13th. Yeah. So I think that's the over under. If I gave it more thought, I bet there might be some ways that I could, ways that I can convince myself that the uh, key demo might be even a little bit lower than a 25% jump. But there we go. There's the math. Live on the air. That's what everyone tunes into WrestleNomics Radio 4 is the live on air math. Last week, we talked about some net income among Japanese wrestling promotions. And in fact, last week, we only talked about All Japan Pro Wrestling and Pro Wrestling Noah. But since then, it has come to light that there are other wrestling promotions available on this source where I found the All Japan and Noah information. So this is uh, from K-A-T-R dot J-P. K-A-T-R, which does stand for something. It stands for Corporate Activity Research Institute, which has a lot of uh, basic financial information for many companies in Japan, apparently. I wish I could tell you why some companies are here and some are not. So, like, we don't have Big Japan or Stardom here. There is a a record for Bushi Road here, but not specifically for New Japan. But we know New Japan's information uh, because of some balance sheets that I've found, uh, which we'll get to. So on this site, we have records, recent records for All Japan, for NOAA, for DDT, and we have a somewhat old record for Dragon Gate. And the headline here is that most of these promotions are not profitable. Not even DDT is profitable. For the fiscal year that ended in January 2007, Dragon Gate was profitable. Uh, I don't know about Dragon Gate at any point after that, unfortunately. But DDT and NOAA, both now subsidiaries of the parent company Cyber Agent, DDT and NOAA not profitable in their two most recent fiscal years. Uh, both of their fiscal years happened to end uh, at the end of September. So we've got DDT losing uh, $800,000 in its fiscal year ending September 2019, losing $380,000 in its fiscal year ending September 2018. Pro Wrestling Noah, we only have one year of record for, so the fiscal year ending September 2019, Pro Wrestling Noah losing $900,000, uh, 
just short of a million for the year. And we've got three fiscal years for All Japan ending in March. So 2020, uh, All Japan not profitable, but close. All Japan not losing nearly as much money as DDT or NOAA are. Uh, most recently, March 2020, that fiscal year, uh, losing only $8,000. The year before that, losing even less, only $4,000 lost. And the year before that, quite a bit worse though, $86,000 lost. I'm converting all this currency from uh, Japanese yen uh, into U.S. dollars. But Dragon Gate in the fiscal year ending January 2017, making a profit, a net income profit of $189,000. $189,000, how does that compare to New Japan? Well, New Japan, in its last two fiscal years, which end, so I should really say not its last two, but in its fiscal years ending July 2018 and July 2019, New Japan made uh, $5.4 million and $4.7 million, respectively, in net income. So New Japan, many, many more times profitable than at least one year that we have record for uh, of Dragon Gate. So we think of the, the common conception that I know of is New Japan by far the leader, uh, followed by, in some order, Dragon Gate and DDT. And I'm not sure where you might say... Uh, Big Japan or Stardom fall fall in the hierarchy, but then followed by um, All Japan and, and NOAA. But uh, New Japan is really the leader, uh, at least in profitability by far. I don't know about revenue here. Revenue was not listed here. Uh, we have some other, it's basically balance sheet information, uh, assets and liabilities. So it doesn't tell us a lot about how much revenue the companies are really generating. So it's altogether possible, you know, and, and I think there's probably in, information out there that would uh, uh, support the idea that, you know, Dragon Gate and DDT are, uh, drawing, uh, more ticket sales, higher attendances than, than NOAA or All Japan are, even though DDT is, uh, losing quite a bit of money. But uh, as far as where I got the New Japan information from, if you go to, uh, somehow, I don't, don't remember how we came across this a few years ago, but, you know, right on the official website, uh, path, njpw.co.jp, there are balance sheets. And when I was doing the uh, 2019 full year WrestleNomics report, I had a I have a revenue number, but I did not have a uh, net income number, and I was not able to find the latest balance sheet. And uh, I even asked some people who uh, who work for New Japan, and they did not know, or I don't know, maybe if they did know, they were not you know able to tell me what the net income was for the fiscal year 2019. But lo and behold, and I suspect all the while. Uh, this balance sheet, uh, along with, and we, and we knew this uh, from previous research, uh, there's balance sheets going back to 2007. And I guess I d just didn't try to uh, change like the uh, the 2017 number that I had in the URL to 2019, but I happened to do that uh, a few days ago or last weekend when I was doing this research. And, and there it was, the 2019 New Japan Pro Wrestling balance sheet. And now we know. Previously, we only knew because of Bushi Road public reporting that uh, the sports, the entire sports division, which is ma the majority of which is made up of New Japan, but not entirely. We knew that was, I think, something like $6 million in net income. But now we know New Japan's net income for the fiscal year of 2019, or I may be saying that wrong, the fiscal year that ended in July 2019. No, I think that is right. Anyway, fiscal year ending July 2019, the company made four million six hundred. And ninety-two thousand dollars in net income. Uh, for for those unfamiliar, net income is a a good or sort of a final measurement of profit. Notable that that's down. That's a decrease from the year prior, in which New Japan made five point five million dollars in net income. So a slightly less profitable uh, fiscal year two thousand nineteen for. New Japan, uh, maybe due to the costs of uh, running more uh, U.S. shows, as New Japan discovers how expensive it is to run in the U.S. without major revenues from, you know, in the form of TV money, TV rights, or pay-per-view revenue to offset those expenses. Hopefully they are learning that. And then from there, our weekly talk about the WrestleNomics Patreon coming back Remember, that is coming back effective October 1st, 
at patreon.com slash russellnomics, offering the $5 per month monthly support, general support only at this point. I will continue to produce all the content that I produce right now, continuing to produce it for free. But over the time that I've been doing Russellnomic stuff more regularly since the pandemic, uh, people have asked me, how can we pay for this somehow? So I'm reopening the member support at patreon.com slash russellnomics. And remember, if you were a patron before in the 2017 to 2018 era, if you are still a current patron, and if you want to contribute $5 monthly, then thank you, don't worry about it, do nothing, and you will become a $5 patron beginning October 1st. And if now is not the right time for you, and you are a current patron, then you can delete your pledge. You should do that as soon as possible so so that it doesn't roll over and charge you on October 1st. You can do that in your account at patreon.com or on the Patreon app on your phone. But if you do choose to support, I will use your funds to invest in better software and research services and recording equipment to make a, a Russellomics that is even better than it is now. I will continue to record the podcast and post the blogs at Russellomics.com in an ad-free environment. I don't know about you, but when I see sometimes a link to a wrestling news site on social media, and the headline is interesting and I want to click on it, I'm sometimes hesitant to click on it because I know when I click on it, not only am I going to be taken out of the environment that I'm in, friction, but when I click on it, I am likely to be taken to a space on the web where a number of ads will pop up and cover over the content that I'm interested in reading and that this will be possibly a distracting and frustrating experience. But at WrestleNomics.com, because of support from listeners and readers like you, the WrestleNomics.com blog is not and will continue to not be inundated with any ads whatsoever. WrestleNomics.com will continue to be a clean sheet. So again, if you want to support, if you go to Patreon.com slash WrestleNomics, you can sign up now as what, what will appear to be a per-creation patron You will not be charged until October 1st. I will not do any paid creations. I never have. I never will. But if you sign up now, you will not be charged until October 1st, at which point you will be charged monthly. So do that if you want, if you're able, and I will really appreciate it. And now, back to the program. And then from there. Time for the main course. I have a new WWE financial estimate. I did this last quarter as well. I decided I'm going to do this quarterly in advance of each uh, WWE quarterly report. And I may even update it and do it more than once within a quarter if news and facts arise that affect WWE's financial picture. So basically, this is something that real financial analysts do uh, who cover stocks, including WWE stock. So today we're going to talk about Q3 and uh, as well as the remainder of the year in Q4. But when I did this in Q2, uh, basically all the analysts... Uh, there's something called a mean analyst estimate that is easy to find. And the mean analyst estimate for WWE's uh, earnings per share, which is a way to think about profit, basically the analysts were way off on Q2. I was not way off on Q2. So what am I talking about? The EPS that the analysts estimated for uh, Q2 was $0.15. Cents. It actually was $0.52. Cents. I had estimated $0.58. Cents. I think all the analysts had... Uh, underestimated how profitable TV production was at the Performance Center, and as a result, uh, greatly underestimated the amount of profit that WWE would uh, generate in Q2. And on revenue, we were all uh, very close. Uh, revenue is easier to figure out than profit is, or at least in this case. So anyway, the point is the Thunderdome changes the picture quite a bit for WWE's finance, finances for the rest of the year. As listeners will know, uh, from mid-March until mid-August, all of WWE's in-ring content was happening in the Performance Center in Orlando, a building that they lease. I don't think they own it. And this made TV production very inexpensive relative to how expensive it is when WWE goes from arena to arena all over the country taping TV. And all the while, while WWE was taping TV at the Performance Center, the revenue that WWE generates relative to Raw and SmackDown 
was not affected at all because the revenue that WWE gets from Raw and SmackDown, even though over that time viewership declined quite a bit, WWE's revenue that it gets for Raw and SmackDown is guaranteed. And in fact, it is guaranteed to escalate over time because that's just the way the contracts are written. So in the short term, the pandemic actually made WWE more profitable, although it did cause WWE to uh, have to not do a regular WrestleMania, which would have been quite profitable for WWE in Q2. However, while taping TV at the Performance Center, WWE's TV viewership declined, as I mentioned, quite a bit. And as WrestleNomics Radio listeners know, there were many questions on the July 30th earnings call uh, that CEO Vince McMahon had to face, questioning him on why ratings were down. And I think most notably, uh, analyst Brandon Ross pointed out that AEW and NXT have bounced back during the pandemic in a way that Raw and SmackDown have not, especially since May or June. And this was not the only earnings call that, that uh, Vince had been questioned on the performance of ratings or other consumer metrics uh, in pre-pandemic times like attendance or like merchandise or WWE Network subscribers. And as we've talked about here in the past, uh, Vince has offered a number of reasons why things have been the way they are. Everything from injuries to having to get over new talent to now blaming the lack of a live audience. And the lack of a live audience certainly is a factor uh, contributing to the decline in viewership, but that does not explain why NXT and AEW have done better with the lack of audience, lack of live audience. You know, that doesn't explain why NXT and, and AEW have been able to bounce back while also dealing with a lack of live audience, whereas Raw and SmackDown have not been able to bounce back, uh, at least so far. And as we discussed earlier, uh, Raw and SmackDown did have a good first week with the Thunderdome. So perhaps feeling the pressure of uh, the questions, maybe pressure from other sources, I don't know, but maybe. You know, WWE is getting feedback from the networks like Fox and USA, but WWE has now moved out of the Performance Center uh, for Raw and SmackDown Productions and moved into the Amway Center, also in Orlando. And there in the Amway Center, working with a company called The Famous Group to create the Thunderdome experience, which is happening right now on, on SmackDown as I record this. However, the Thunderdome uh, tapings are going to certainly be more expensive than the Performance Center tapings were. Uh, they'll still be in a fixed location, and that's good for uh, saving money versus the traditional way of uh, taping Raw and SmackDown from one arena to the next. But this is clearly going to be a more expensive setup. Now, WWE is reportedly paying just $450,000 for about two months of residency at the Amway Center, which is a great deal. And it kind of makes sense that they, that they would get a great deal because we're in the pandemic era where nobody's trying to rent out the Amway Center in all likelihood. The Orlando Magic are playing uh, basketball in Disney World right now, not at the Amway Center. Nobody's doing concerts or any other types of events. And in fact, we know that $450,000 number is pretty accurate because uh, my 13 news in Orlando has uh, published the contract, the agreement that they were able to obtain, I believe through a Freedom of Information Act request or a Sunshine request, which is something that could be done in Florida. So they've published the agreement and the agreement states that uh, WWE is being charged 12500 for Sunday events, uh, 10000 for Monday and Friday events, basically we're on SmackDown, 7500 for any Working days where W is not necessarily taping, but is working on the premises. And then 2500 for any dark days where no work is being done. Again, this agreement goes from August 14th to October 31st. So basically, I took all those terms and I put that stuff into a spreadsheet and, and created a date column and basically did the estimate. And if you assume there's going to be a bunch of working days at first where they're just getting used to the setup and setting it up, and if you assume there's going to be a working day... Uh, on each Saturday before they have a pay-per-view taping, and then assume that they're going to do an additional pay-per-view that is not named in the agreement uh, in October. I would think there's got to be a pay-per-view in October sometime. Then I do get, over the, the course of the agreement from August 14th to October 31st, exactly $450,000. So that's just in use fees for using the venue. Uh, the contract also states that there are 
labor expenses that the Amway Center will bill WWE for. So this looks to be uh, work from uh, Amway Center staff. The agreement says labor to include, but not limited to, police, paramedics, security, house, stage, and chair setup crews, parking lot use and staff, cleanup staff, and supervision of the same. And there's also miscellaneous items listed, including catering, outside equipment. So anyway, we are talking $450,000 for about two and a half months. And this could be extended, but for two and a half months, plus whatever labor expenses, whatever miscellaneous expenses. Now, those may be relatively small, the labor expense and the miscellaneous expense. But the additional expense associated with doing the Thunderdome that is probably not small is whatever they're paying the famous group to provide the Thunderdome. So I, I know I've seen, uh, we've got folks out there, including Brian Alvarez, saying that it's going to be a big savings still running at the Amway Center, and it may be, but it is certainly going to be more expensive than the Performance Center. And we have to keep in mind the expense of the compensation to the famous group for helping provide the Thunderdome. And I don't have a strong sense for what the specific uh, production cost will be or is for the famous group. And it's not even clear to me exactly what entails everything that, that the famous group is providing. Um, I would guess at a minimum, the famous group is providing all the screens that have the fans uh, you know, videoed in. Now, it's possible that the famous group is sort of only providing the IT uh, service related to that. It's, it's possible that WWE is, you know, that WWE set up that, the, the screens themselves in-house and are just using the famous group to help transmit the video to the screens. Or maybe the famous group is providing the screens as well. And maybe the famous group is providing other production elements uh, in addition to that. So I don't know. I could see the expense being somewhat less. I could see the expense being similar or greater than the normal costs of W's production at an arena. As I talk this through again out loud, I, I would lean towards somewhat less than, but still substantially more than the PC cost. But I could see it being as high as whatever the cost was to produce Raw and SmackDown at an arena uh, in pre-pandemic times. Because I could see that being the highest that uh, Vince McMahon could justify uh, in order to answer the questions and secure WWE's future and its future TV rights value long term. So because of that, I modeled into my uh, WWE financial estimate model an operating expense on WWE's core content and on the WWE network lines. So core content involves Raw and SmackDown and the network involves pay-per-views. So I modeled in a slightly increased rate relative to what I estimate were the operating expenses in those segments in the period immediately before COVID took production out of the arenas. A slightly increased rate to account for the gradual increase in cost and talent, and perhaps other areas. Certainly, W has to do COVID testing. That's probably a relatively small expense. That's something that does contribute. So this results in a significantly less profitable year of 2020 than I've previously estimated because I've previously just been under the assumption that, I don't know, I guess they're just going to stay at the Performance Center maybe for the rest of the year. But as a result of modeling in a higher expense related to Raw and SmackDown and pay-per-views, the net income estimate that I get for the full year remains within the range of the company's current all-time uh, inflation-adjusted net income record, which was set in 2018, which was $99.6 million. So I still get about a $100 million net income, uh, which I, I did not reverse engineer it that way, but that's just the way it turned out. So under this estimate, I'm assuming that there will be no ticketed live events for the rest of the year, and I'm assuming that there will be no second uh, Saudi Arabia event that would be very lucrative. I'm assuming that that won't be happening. Uh, I got the impression from Vince on the last earnings call that, that that seemed less likely in 2020. So I know Dave uh, Meltzer, the Wrestling Observer, pointed out in this week's issue uh, in response to my estimate, uh, which you can read, by the way. Uh, you can read my estimate at WrestleNomics.com. Uh, he thinks that it's likely that W will try to do uh, some sort of event with fans actually in person in attendance uh, before the end of the year. And uh, I think that, think that's very possible. I could imagine there being maybe some sort of uh, 
mixed Thunderdome and live in-person fan experience uh, in Orlando in the coming months. Uh, even with some uh, ticketed events or some fans uh, attending shows in some limited capacity, I, I don't know that that's going to change greatly the uh, the profitability of the company for the remainder of the year. Although it would be a way to get back to selling some venue merch when we're talking about fans probably in the hundreds, though, because that's about where uh, AEW is right now uh, with their limited seating at Daly's Place. And AEW is back to doing uh, venue merch again as well with the limited fans uh, who are there with contactless, contactless sales. But I think we're a long way from having a normal thousands of people in attendance. So overall, we're, I'm looking at a uh, Q3 of about $13 million in net income based on 20, excuse me, $222 million in revenue for Q3. For Q4, at this point, uh, estimating $233 million in revenue, coming down to a net income of $17 million getting to $100 million on the year in net income, which would be a new record. I think maybe if you adjust it for inflation, it could be short of 2018's 99.6 in 2018 dollars, but uh, pretty close. So will this all be worth it? Is the investment in the Thunderdome, uh, will the improvement to viewership that we are already seeing with Raw and with SmackDown, at least in the first instances, will that improvement... Uh, be consistent. Will it last? Uh, I think we're going to see, and what we are seeing is a short-term curiosity that will last for a few weeks. It, I think the, the the bump that we saw for the first Raw and the first SmackDown in the Thunderdome, uh, that bump will be less in the second week, less in the third week. And then in the fourth week, in the case of Raw, it will be going head-to-head with not AEW, not a political party convention, but with the return of Monday Night Football on September 14th, with the first week of Monday Night Football on ESPN, the doubleheader as usual for the first week, uh, Pittsburgh Steelers versus New York Giants, uh, followed by starting at 10, Tennessee Titans versus Denver Broncos. And I think we do see a, um, a change in viewership even before, this is, I think this is underappreciated, and I should probably look into this more closely to see if what I'm saying is how true uh, what I'm saying is that I think, yes, uh, the NFL games, Monday Night Football does affect Raw, but I think we also see in September, uh, even before the football games start, because the football games usually are not on the first week of September. Uh, there's usually, in fact, a Labor Day. So maybe it's just the Labor Day uh, uh, holiday effect, but I think uh, what could also be a factor in contributing to the the change, the, the decline in, in viewerships is the change in people's uh, schedules as uh, – a lot of people start going back to school, young people, obviously, uh, who are coincidentally the viewers that are hardest to hold on to in, in this linear TV universe. But anyway, I think this is good for a, a at least a short term bump in viewership. We'll see if it continues through September, though. I am skeptical. And I think that, uh, you know, Vince's answer that the reason for the decline in viewership is because there's not a live audience there. And uh, even if this, you know, the, the Thunderdome makes up for that somewhat. Clearly, it doesn't completely. Uh, the, uh, the <laughs> I mean, we see fans there. Some sometimes they look bored. Sometimes they look like they're you know pumping their fists uh, when they're not uh, showing uh, disturbing images or whatever. But the you know it's important that fans are there visually. But even more important than that is the audio that fans provide in terms of their crowd reactions and what we are what we have here with the Thunderdome in terms of audio is not uh, any audio that's actually generated from the fans who are uh, you know appearing remotely. Uh, but what we have in terms of audio is audio that is apparently taken from the the WWE video game and uh, you know and piped into the mix. So the the most important element among the, the fan element, which is the audio, is still absent from the program. And so, so there's that. And then even beyond that, the idea that it's just the lack, lack of live audience uh, that is contributing to the vast majority of the decline doesn't hold up under scrutiny. Again, the there's been a bounce back for NXT. There's been a bounce back for AEW Dynamite. There has not been, uh, before the Thunderdome, a bounce back for Raw and SmackDown. 
which would lead one to believe that maybe there's a problem besides the lack of fans that is contributing to the decline. And I think that it's the booking style, the creative style of Vince McMahon just makes it very hard to invest in characters, personalities, matches, storylines. And while Raw and SmackDown have the longest legacy and the largest audience to begin with, they are also turning fans away more readily because their product doesn't do as much to hold on to fans. So I see this as a the Thunderdome as a short-term fix, a short-term improvement to viewership that again does not address the real underlying problem, which is the performance of the CEO in the role of head of creative. The decline in consumer metrics uh, before COVID, including TV viewership, but also including ticket sales, network subscriptions, merchandise sales, were all in decline in 2019, with the exception of network subscribers in 2018. Those metrics were in decline in 2018 as well. So I think there is clearly a secular or non-cyclical pattern of decreased interest, which was present before the pandemic. And there is clearly a, a PR message that everybody is on the same page about, which I've heard from Vince. I believe I've also heard it from Triple H and from Stephanie you know, in recent public comments that they've made that WWE has a 30-year track record. And there's nothing to worry about. They've got a 30-year track record of creating compelling stars and compelling storylines. We have a 30-plus year track record of creating compelling characters and engaging a variety of audiences. And we obviously remain confident we can continue that with our collective ability, even in the most challenging environments with no live audience. So that's Vince on July 16th at the annual shareholders meeting. MLW has created a number of stars who have gotten over in a relative sense, have become stars and sold merchandise and have contributed to the value of the promotion in a number of ways. W hasn't, for the last 15 years, created a star who has boosted economics long term in the way that John Cena did when he was created in 2005 as a top level star, nor those who came before him, like The Rock, Steve Austin, Hulk Hogan. I think there was a window there in about 2016, 2015, with all three members of the Shield, or any three members of them. Roman Reigns came the closest, and clearly the most effort was exuded on him. But I think the window has passed on getting Roman Reigns to be the level of star that John Cena became. And creative leadership in WWE seems to have gradually lost its understanding of its consumer base over the last two decades. And rather than realize and address that issue, it's evident there's a culture of denial about this within the company. The idea that it's it's not the company that's the problem, it's the consumer base that's the problem. And in fact, now is a great time for... This Week in Wrestling Fan Resentment. Because of the wrestling business, the customer is always wrong. Here on the Wrestling Fan Resentment portion of the show, we'll seek out advice from noted wrestling philosophers who know all too well from their irreplaceable first-hand experience that the problem at the center of today's industry are those annoying wrestling fans. Those customers who just keep ruining the business for wrestlers and executives alike with their sheer fickle unpredictability. This week we hear from noted wrestling philosopher, The King, Baron Corbin, who noted this insight on Twitter this past Monday following SummerSlam the day before. The King said, Internet fans cannot be pleased no matter what. They say, wear blue. You wear blue. They hate blue. Why would you wear blue? We want this. Okay, here. We hate that. They are impossible, and they wonder why people don't listen to them. Within the same hour, Angel Garza chimed in and affirmed, quote, we are in the complaining era. Unhappiness era. End quote. This was following the largely well-reviewed SummerSlam pay-per-view. This has been another week in Wrestling Fan Resentment. So in 
until WWE, or really Vince McMahon himself and the culture he has created around him, shows a willingness to reckon with the possibility that the core of WWE's problems with declining interest lies not with talent injuries or waiting for talent to get over or with the absence of live audiences, but with his own performance as head of creative. Until then, there is no reason to expect any internal cause of long-term improvement to WWE's consumer metrics, whether that's TV ratings or otherwise. WWE is fortunate it finds itself in a media market where the value of its live content has exploded. It has exploded not because of anything internal that WWE has done, but because of external market effects within the media ecosystem that has resulted in live content like its live in-ring content becoming multiple times more valuable than it was in other prior eras when WWE was more popular. And there are opportunities to continue to grow the value of its content despite these issues. New president and chief revenue officer Nick Khan will likely be tasked with selling the company's pay-per-view events that are currently primarily on the W Network streaming service. He's going to be tasked with selling those pay-per-view events to a major streaming player. Market circumstances insulate WWE from any larger financial hardship, but it also removes the economic pressure that might cause there to be some kind of introspection which is needed to create more valuable stars, to make the stars that they have more valuable, and to create storylines and matches that people care about. But more concerning for the next few years is that WWE is on a trajectory where the viewership lead that the company's flagship shows have over AEW's Dynamite program is shrinking. And that is the big risk. And that is why it's so important that NXT goes head-to-head with AEW Dynamite on Wednesday night. Not just because of the potential of growing value for NXT in terms of getting TV rights for it in the future, but to block AEW's Dynamite program from getting too close to the viewership of Raw or SmackDown by comparison. Why is that important? AEW's TV deal with Warner Media expires in 2023. There's an option to continue that deal into 2024. If that option is picked up, it will result in AEW Dynamite, W Raw, and W SmackDown being up for renegotiation around the same time in the middle of 2022. By that point, WWE and AEW's ratings may be even more comparable than they are now. But right now, on a per hour basis, WWE flagship content is worth about 12 times that of AEW's content. Again, that's on a per hour basis. Raw and SmackDown, they're worth about $470 million average annual value. That's five hours. AEW is already producing two. They're supposed to produce three as part of this deal. Expect an additional one-hour program sometime in the not-too-distant future. All that's worth $45 million on an average annual basis. Three hours. For AEW, that's $15 million per hour. WWE, they're producing five hours for for $470 million a year. Five hours, that's $191 million for each hour per year. So again, 191 for WWE, 15 for AEW. If two years from now, the viewership of Dynamite is comparable to the viewership of Raw and or SmackDown, it doesn't make sense that that lead of 12 times can be sustained. And in that scenario, that either means WWE's TV value gets an okay increase or even goes down, and AEW's TV value gets an increase of multiples. And in that case, the amount of TV revenue that WWE and AEW rake in becomes more comparable. WWE's still a bigger company in terms of revenue generation, but AEW would get a lot closer. And the wrestling competition that just a couple years ago seemed unimaginable will get even more intense. The economics of the TV industry and the media industry uh, years away are hard to predict. What's easier to predict and what there's a 15-year track record of is WWE's 
futile creative process and its inability to develop stars beyond a certain level. Whatever happened with Keith Lee on Monday is only the latest example of how WWE repeatedly and seemingly without fail makes talent less marketable within weeks of their promotion from NXT to the main roster. And what is easier to predict than the economics of the TV business are the almost gravitational pull of WTV ratings down and to the right. So I'll put out as a prediction that by, let's say, March 2022, AEW Dynamite is within 5% of WWE Raw's performance in P1849 and P2+. And what should have been an insurmountable monopoly in the pro wrestling industry in the United States anyway, will have clearly become a duopoly. So I will leave you with that. I continue to work on a WB developmental research project. I've gotten some great help on that. Uh, scraping the data from cagematch.net using Python and getting a lot of the relevant information put into various columns thanks to a collaborator who has been very helpful. So I've just uh, been sorting through that in the last couple days. It's a, a subject that I've been meaning to get to and that I've done some some other preliminary uh, research on. But this looks to be uh, this uh, data set that we have now is definitely the best one to get at answering some of the questions that uh, we want to answer. And it should allow us to compare all of WWE's uh, various developmental eras of the last couple decades and to get an idea of the relative output of the expensive WWE Performance Center. So I look forward to working on that and writing something about that in the future. But until then, you can read me on WrestleNomics.com, follow WrestleNomics at WrestleNomics, follow me at Brandon Thurston. And I'm Brandon Thurston, and I'll talk to you next time.